So welcome everyone. It's our great pleasure today to have another uh, knowledge dissemination dialogue. And today's presentation is by Emmanuel Cabale from uh, FAO. He'll be talking about exploring an integrated approach to AMR control in food and agriculture, uh, talking some voices from the field, uh, results from our former field school pilots that he's done. Just a little bit of background and uh, hopefully you can still see my slide uh, background here. Uh, in terms of logistics, we'd ask that all the participants keep their background microphones on mute. If you would like to rename yourself so your organization is shown, so we can acknowledge you if you have questions. Um, those views presented here are those of the speakers and not specifically of FAO. And I know uh, our speaker knows this, but for any participants, please refrain from advertising any services or commercial products or anything in the chat. And finally, uh, post your, check, uh, your questions in the chat and uh, we will uh, go through those and answer them at the presentation, after the presentation during the discussion period. So uh, again, acknowledge that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, if you do not wish to be heard, don't say anything. Uh, the video recording and the PowerPoint will be posted on our FAO YouTube channel uh, for sharing in the future. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna pass the microphone over to uh, Emmanuel. If you'd like to share your screen, please go ahead with the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff and um, Emmanuel Cavalli. Um, I'm sharing, um, I'm doing this presentation on behalf of um, um, our big team um, working on AMR at, at the FAO on a project that is funded by the Fleming Fund. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, it looks great. Please proceed. I'm, I'm sharing the correct screen in, in, in full presentation mode. Thank you. Yeah. So um, a little bit of background. You can see the title of the presentation has changed a little bit uh, because we are we are a bit more on the action um, oriented side of, of, of the fight against the MR. And um, um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll really run through um, the presentation with those um, um, that outline and looking at how we came to settle for this approach um, in trying to um, um, promote good practices in, in, in agriculture and specifically animal production to fight AMR. Um, so a little bit of a background. Um, we work in a project funded by the Fleming Fund, and this is a multi-country project that uh, is run by FAO, but provides support to, to member countries. Um, we are present in 12 countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in South and Southeast Asia. And we target 12 countries, uh, seven are in Africa and five are in Asia. When we started around 2016, 2017, um, our main thrust was to support the implementation of the FAO action plan on AMR through the project. Our project was perfectly designed and aligned to the FAO action plan. And um, so we had four objectives uh, similar to the FAO action plans for um, objectives. And uh, our overarching focus was to improve laboratory capacity and diagnosis, um, as well as uh, data and surveillance of AMR. We were also focusing on, on, on building capacity to collect drug resistance data uh, in food and agriculture sectors, um, to enable the sharing of drug resistant data locally, regionally, and internationally, and to collect the data on AMR and also to encourage the application of this data to promote the rational use of antimicrobials. And the presentation today is really um, was is, is really um, around how the last bullet point um, has driven us to um, adopt the pharma field score approach. Um, so specifically under that objective number four, 
we were focusing on good practices in the food and agriculture sector and based on international instruments such as the codex um, and um, to make sure that these are available too and are implemented in the target country, in the 12 target countries that we had. Uh, we were also um, focused on supporting communities of AMR practice and to initiate behavior change pilots and application of adult learning methods to promote uh, good practice around antimicrobial use. We also targeted to uh, contribute to the to the mass of um, of of data uh, through peer reviewed um, scientific journals. And at at one at at some point, we of course had uh, the, the, the 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 usual boxes you have to tick on a project, and. I think in the we had a three-year project, and at the beginning of the third year, we had this text box. I extracted this for framing, um, and this and the question we were asking our superiors in Rome were asking us as a team: Is are we winning? Because if you look at the very last row here, um, we were we were looking at a proportion of targeted key stakeholders reporting change in practices and behaviors related to the use of antimicrobials and we at 75% in this in this third year of the project but deep down our hearts we were asking and our minds is this correct are we are we on track are we actually winning are we doing this uh, the right way and in a sense for me i I, I take it that we were talking to ourselves, we were speaking to professionals, we were speaking to veterinarians, we were speaking amongst ourselves in a language we are very vested in um, pharmaceuticals, regulatory, uh, regulatory science, distribution of drugs. But, and, and, and thanks to, to our leaders at that time, the, the project leads in Rome, we knew we were missing an opportunity. There was something we could do right. And, and we had this opportunity to do it. And so we, 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 we had the confidence then to try and shift our approach uh, on objective four from a veterinary biological science driven approach to something else, something more social science approach based, something more downward looking and something more bottom up um, um, approach. And I've, I've skipped a, a lot of slides here, maybe a hundred slides to get to this slide because we eventually decided, let's go to the countries, selected countries that were interested. Let's go and listen to the farmers. Let's go and hear the people on the ground. What really matters to them? What does AMR mean to them? And with the, with the support of our social science team uh, led by Mark um, Obonio, and I think at this time with working with Professor Dennis Gerongaba, we went to the five countries in Africa, um, that's Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and conducted CAP studies. That involved um, a little over 700 farmers. And we, with, we did knowledge, attitude, and practice studies um, among farmers, their veterinarians, and agro, agro vets. And we had quite interesting results coming out of that. Uh, for instance, AM use and AMR patterns um, um, were by a diverse range of behaviors were, were affected and influenced by a diverse uh, range of behaviors across the production cycle. Um, and therefore we realized very quickly that a single target intervention was unlikely to be successful. Exactly what we had seen in the, in the, in the three years previous to this. Um, we also noted that um, respondents' knowledge of at, and, and of and attitudes towards AM use and AMR did not predict their AM use and AMR relevant practices. And so we concluded there that awareness raising alone was not likely to produce the behavior change we were desiring. And, and, and therefore, by implication, uh, we realized AMR needed interventions um, and, and approaches that can target practices across different production value chains and also expanded beyond just raising awareness. So we started the project with, if we tell them the best practices, these are the standards, don't do this, do that, process meet this way to safeguard 
um, 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 a life and 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 keep keep the quality, um, that wasn't going going to work really, um, and so we moved forward and 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 explored and thanks again to our social science team, we explored what the best approach would be to try and change behaviors, and we eventually chose the pharma field school approach, um, and with this approach our our main aim, our, our high level target was um, to try and, and, and generate data for action around AMR, AM use and AM residues to inform um, a policy and, and, and other action on AMR that take a one health approach. Um, we're, we're quite aware that lack of high quality data on AMR, AMU and AMC are a major barrier to effective and informed decision making. And this is much bigger than just behaviors. Investments into AMR from, from the grassroots up to the global level really uh, requires a reliable data. And we noted that we, we, we struggle to have and demonstrate um, those reliable data. So I'll take a step back a little bit and no, assuming that others that will listen to this may not really be aware of what we are speaking about. So the Pharma Field School, what is it? Um, um, this is, is an initiative that was crafted by FAO a little over 30 years ago, and it's called uh, A School Without Wars. And, and at this school, we have 15 to 25, up to 30 farmers. Uh, with a common interest, uh, learning best ways of production through observation and experimentation. Um, and, and there is a facilitator who guides the discussion and, and, and the group meets at least once a week or twice a week or, or twice a month, depending on the production cycle they are working in. So it's quite flexible in that sense. Uh, the length of the field school is usually around uh, a full production cycle. And, and in poultry, when we are doing layers, it runs for around six months. At least we rent some for that long. And when you look at broilers, it will run for around one cycle, run for around six to eight weeks. There are a few steps uh, in, in the implementation of the, the field school. Um, so a typical field school session is around three to five hours. And it involves um, um, conducting, having a roll call, um, 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 having a roll call, um, conducting an, 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 an ecosystem, um, um, e e ecosystem um, 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 a process uh, called a ESA. Um, and, and there are group dynamics involved, so everyone is expected to participate. Um, once in a while, based on the group's demand, we we. We bring special topics to, to, to a session where they learn about um, a specific technical, even including social and other issues. Um, and then there's a review of the day's work and, and they plan uh, for the next session. Uh, just to be clear, uh, an ISA is a, an agroecosystem analysis. And specifically when we do, for instance, the broiler production, it's, it's, it's renamed a, a BESA, so um, a broiler ecosystem uh, analysis. Uh, a few critical characteristics of a field school is that we, 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 we emphasize the use of non-formal adult learning, which is experimentation, uh, hands-on, um, on the, in the field uh, learning. Uh, we also um, focus on a farmer-driven learning experience with co-creation as, as one of the key drivers of the solutions to, to the presented problems. Uh, we have a problem-solving and a local knowledge embracing approach. So every answer is correct. And of course, the facilitator is there to, in a way, sense check the approaches, but not to hand not a bot a, a top-down handing of solutions approach. And sometimes we have in-depth uh, understanding of the ecology and the local constraints and, and the facilitator just facilitates and not teaches, as, as I have said. Um, so we, we are also able to run experiments depending on the demand or also the focus of, of, of the intervention. And um, in, in this case, for instance, um, we in the pictures you can see farmers have their own approaches and and they work as a community 
they work as a team together uh, at a host farm. And the host farm is where one of the farmers hosts the school and the other farmers visit the school and they, and they grow, um, in this case, um, the cycle of product. We were looking at layers in this case. Um, this is, of course, guided by, by, by facilitator. So when we set up the field schools from the cup, we had, we, had, we, had, we had five countries. Of course, one country, in this case, Tanzania, found um, the approach in layers of broilers um, uh, not feasible at the time. So we took a different approach and worked with, um, with, with the Maasai, the, 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 the pastoralists. Uh, but in the four countries where we actually applied the, the farmer field schools, we implemented 25 uh, field schools um, and we had about 750 poultry farmers participate. Um, the, the farmer field school learning curriculums were informed by the, the, the CAP studies and several FFS, um, especially under the broiler, lasted multiple cycles. And we are proud to say for two years now, cycles, some of the field schools um, are, are, still, are still running. We also have framed an evaluation um, around the layer field schools, and these were conducted in, in, in Ghana and in Kenya. And the idea here was to do a cross-sectional survey comparing uh, farmer field school graduates um, with a sample of non-farmer field school uh, graduates. And we had about 154 farmers participate uh, in the evaluation. This evaluation ran for a course of six months. Um, and, and so we were trying to check the adherence um, um, of, of graduates to, to practices that they had learned during the, the cycles of, of, of their practice um, 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 when farmer field schools um, um, were running. Uh, we know that most of the practices that were recommended were around biosecurity, and we're trying to compare the business as usual um, among the, the, the non-graduates to the graduates who would have adopted some of these um, some of the early findings we had there was that around 67% of the field school graduates uh, reported that they did not use antimicrobials for any other purpose except for treatment, and, and, and this compared to only 15% of non-field school um, uh, farmers that, 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 that reported that. And also we noted that farmer field school graduates were significantly more likely to keep um, 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 more likely to keep um, um, regular farm records compared to, to non-field school um, graduates. We have a publication um, 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 uh, on this, and, and I think there are links at the end of the presentation that you can, you can, you can look at. And so over the eight months of evaluation, uh, 65 uh, farmer field school graduates and 35 non-graduates were uh, completed the evaluation, the eight months period. And there were monthly visits to, to the farms. And I think we also went beyond just the farms to um, traders and also input suppliers um, um, in that. So um, just a few slides to really summarize some of the findings that we got here um, is that we saw a significant difference between farmer field school and non-farmer field school participants in terms of frequencies of diseases and disease symptoms uh, reported in chickens and in chicks and in growers. And then from the 85 medicines that were used, uh, pharma field schools obtained prescription, pharma field school graduates obtained prescriptions around 75 time percent compared to non-field school um, um, graduates uh, that, that, that were only 18%. That, that got a, a prescription for, for medication. And also from the 115 um, reported disease episodes or incidences, um, an animal health professional was sought 82 times by the field school um, facilitators, uh, which was about 65% of the times and only 22 times for, for non-field school um, participants. Uh, at this point, and we are being very careful, and, and I think my, my social science colleagues would would, would, would back this up uh, during discussion. We are being careful not to think this is a win for farmer field school, but this demonstrates potential uptake, uptake of the good practices that, 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 that we need to promote. And remember um, when I started, we spoke of speaking to ourselves, but here we, we, we see an opportunity that we, we are able to 
to actually promote good practices among those farmers that that take part in the in the field school. Um, we also looked at um, the economics of, of production um, through the field schools. And there are interesting findings here, and these are also early findings. And, and that is um, FFS uh, participants uh, spend significantly less on antibiotics across the evaluation period, that eight months. And also FFS graduates spend less money per egg compared to a sample of farmers who are not enrolled in the farmer field schools. Um, these findings are quite early, and I think the sample size is very small. I know they're the they're, they're, they're economics uh, experts in the meeting today, and we can have a discussion around here. And so we we, we, are, we are aware that um, um, this uh, specific uh, expenditure bit was not significantly um, 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 was not the, the the difference was not significant um, um, and statistically significant in this in the in this particular case. But we think we are we are able to frame a case here around the economics um, um, of, of of animal production, and and in the in the forecast I'm going to mention um, what we plan to do. Um, so I think uh, in a nutshell um, we 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 know based on the quantitative and qualitative surveys that we conducted. We, we know that through the farmer field school, we are able to decrease um, um, antimicrobial use on the farm. Uh, we are able to um, increase investment and, and adherence to biosecurity, and we are able to increase interactions with animal health professionals. And in those 50 slides I skipped before, um, these are some of the things that were, we found through the CAP um, as being priority areas for, for potential intervention. Um, we also put in a component, a, a, a component of behavior science um, and, and in, our, in our interventions, um, besides, of course, the biological sciences related to AMR and AM use. And, and what, we are, uh, what, we are, what we are able to, to, to find here um, around behavior science is that farmers make decisions, of course, this is known, um, bounded within their enablers and barriers, so such as the economics, uh, the veterinary service, um, ability to access those, the influence of the neighbors and family, and, and, and that these um, enablers and, and barriers influence their decisions more than the sense of the good practices. So to a farmer, AMR doesn't mean much, Production means means much more. Um, also, the decisions with the potential to impact AMUs and AMR are made across the entire production chain. So it's not a one-off decision. Um, um, I, I, and I think situations like high mortalities are, are likely to influence the decision of a farmer to use antimicrobials more than the logic and the knowledge that antimicrobial use without a prescription um, um, is not recommended. And also that um, access to services and attitudes and or, or sufficiency of knowledge do not necessarily translate into adherence to, to practices. Um, a good example of a behavioral intervention was an intervention we made um, um, for, for promoting the use of footpaths because again, during the CAP studies, we realized most farmers who knew what a, a, a footpath was was used was was intended, and actually had footpaths on their farms. The majority of them didn't actually use them, and when you ask them why they didn't use them, I think generally the perception was that they were not effective. Um, um, also, one of the critical um, um, outcomes, specifically in Ghana, that came out was that um, uh, use of footpath was expensive because disinfectant was quite expensive. And when the behavior team and the social science team uh, prodded further, we realized that things like, for instance, when a dip is sold or when a, when a disinfectant is sold, there's no measuring device sold with a disinfectant. And so the farmers would use scents, they'll pour water in the footpath and pour as much disinfectant as they thought would be sufficient to be effective. And, 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 and that, apparently was a barrier for them to use the footpaths. And, and, and one of the outcomes of this behavioral in, intervention and insight was that in Ghana, for instance, we developed 
um, a local solution to measuring um, and the amount of disinfectant to put in a footpath. And the, the outcome there was that um, the farmers realized um, a container of, of disinfectant that would last a month or less was able to last three to four months. And so it, over two production cycles, or in, 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 layer, in, in the case of layers, over a full production cycle of a, of a year, they would use only two, three containers where they used to use one container every month. And so that um, um, was one of the outcomes that, that enabled farmers to adhere to, to show adherence among field school participants to biosecurity measure, in this case, the use um, 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 of a food bath. Um, I'll, I'll use a few minutes to wrap up um, this knowing I've used quite substantial time. What is the way forward? Um, um, so with, uh, with, with what I've described before, um, and there's a bit more detail that we can get from, from our team here, we, we see potential in the field school as, um, as, as a source, as a data generating um, platform, also as, as, as a site for, for, for promoting good behaviors, but also for sustainable, um, um, for sustainable um, uh, behavior change here. Um, we see also an opportunity to scale this approach because it's a flexible approach. It has got local framing. So we are not asking the same thing to be done across different regions within a country and across countries. We are aiming to have common targets with locally framed interventions around the pharma field school. We also I believe this has, has very strong geographical adaptability, it, 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 including the respect of customs and, and local traditions and beliefs. Um, and, and, and also we, we, we believe we are likely to have um, um, systematic change um, 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 using this approach. Um, also, we, we, we feel uh, we are able to, to generate sufficient data for action around antimicrobial use, um, around um, and the quality of, of products, and so substandard falsified um, antimicrobials. We are able to also have social science interventions, behavior science interventions, and also promote uh, good husbandry practices. Uh, we are careful going forward in framing our interventions because we need to pair data um, as perfectly as possible. And this has been quite a challenge where we would like to pair all these data points from antimicrobial resistance, economics, behaviors, behavior interventions, um, and economics so that we are able to try and see correlations uh, 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 through a production cycle. I'm sure you're all aware that this is not an easy um, um, a thing to do, um, but our team again on the ground has really made a, 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 a good effort to try and design um, a study um, and, and an approach that, that will be able to provide um, um, as best um, an, an outcome as possible. We, we, we also think that, um, I'm gonna skip a few slides, yeah, we also we also think that we are able to, and if you look down um, um, to to the left here, we we also think that with with the pilots that we are planning to to run, learning from these results, we we are able to scale this through other initiatives. And I think there's an initiative to reduce the need of antimicrobials um, um, in agri food systems. This is an FAO initiative uh, that that seems to target around the hundred countries. And, and we, we, we think this approach could be useful in, in such a, a mammoth uh, intervention and initiative because of its flexibility. And, and we are also seeing uptake of this approach by other partners outside FAO um, 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 in Africa specifically, because I think we, we see that um, it is very, um, very flexible and close cross-cutting. And finally, I think we are able to support now um, the implementation of the FAO's um, um, st strategy on, on, on AMR or approach. Um, as you can see, where there's the number two, that, that relates to, to, to mainly the behavioral, and the, the social science approach, the pharma field school approach. And we are able to frame this around awareness engagement, surveillance and research, um, promoting the good practices, and also uh, promoting responsible use. Um, um, I'll, I'll end my presentation with an acknowledgement of um, a lot of technical input. Uh, of course, I acknowledge Mark Caldo's work 
because he's our boots on the ground. Uh, he takes the heat when we do this work. He, he bears the brunt and the stress and, and he has to think through a lot of framing. Uh, we are grateful to Dennis Pierungaba who helped us with the, with the, with, with, with the framing, the science approach um, uh, to this, uh, the, 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 the veterinary approach, the animal health approach to, to the pilots that we ran. Uh, Annika is responsible for the behavior science and we worked with Courtney Price as well in the framing of this um, at the beginning. Um, our projects have gone through several lead technical um, co colleagues um, from Sarah to Marcus and Jushan. And of course, the CBOs who are, who are the budget holders and, and their team has been very supportive uh, to, pro to provide funding to our work. I would like to acknowledge, of course, the role of Jeff um, in, in leading the science behind and this work, Susan Eckford, um, Antonio and Alejandro, who've been very, very, very supportive in, in framing our work. And also our Fleming Fund team, which is, uh, we have over 30 um, active staff working with us to, to, to run these pilots in the countries and regions. But we, 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 without the farmers, the governments, the veterinarians and other colleagues, we, we are running into the thousands of participants to deliver this, this work. And also the reference centers in the UK and in Denmark that have been very supportive of our work. And, and of course, the funding agency, which is the UK uh, Fleming Fund. Um, um, I have uh, a slide here highlighting around seven of the publications we've made um, arising from this work. And, and feel free to access those. Uh, I believe the slides will be shared. And um, I'll end with that and, and maybe hand back to Jeff to, to open for a discussion. Thank you. I lost my, uh, my earbud there. Thank you so much, uh, Manuel. Um, I, I really like this. I'm in particular, by, probably by my personal experience, in, early on in my career, uh, in relation to education awareness raising and behavioral change, I, I, I found that my approaches on the throw it at the wall and see what sticks theory. And that's really not the case. When you talk about uh, behavior change, it's actually underpinned by science, uh, social science and behavior science that you know, there's theories and there's practices and we can predict what will, and it's, it's a great, this is a real one health approach, I think, to integrate uh, behavioral sciences into understanding why people make those decisions and mental models and make changes, uh, whether it involves economics or other social factors. So I think this is a real good example of how, how things can happen. We got a couple of questions and I have a couple of questions. Um, I think I'll ask one of mine first. Um, in your um, uh, economic assessment there, gender looked like it showed up as a factor. Now, which, uh, which gender had the more economic benefit and why do you think that might be? With your microphone off, oh, on, sorry, you off. With my microphone on, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, Chief, yeah. Gender had um, um, a, 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 a significant um, um, effect here. Yeah. It, it, no, uh, Jeff. Um, oh, did I not get that right? No, 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 no. no. Um, gender had an effect on the cost per egg. Yeah, okay, but, but, but yeah, but, but 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 not on the drug cost. So you 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 got right, you got that right. Um, I I can get support from Mark here, but my understanding and the framing here is that among yes, Mark, I think we found more benefit among the female gender here than than the male gender. Mark, would you like to step in? Thank you. Yeah, that is correct. Um, yeah, yeah. so most of our um female participants the um the poultry was their primary i can turn on my video here excuse me um was their primary um income generating activity um so even when we were looking at the uptake of practices from the farmer field school we found greater adherence among females compared to males because like i said in some of the um our our male participants um you know, the keeping of the layers was something that they were doing 
that was combined with, say, a wage labor, wage labor job in Nairobi or around Nairobi. Um, so we found that the, um, the, the woman farmers were much more, I, I think, focused on, on kind of the farm um, and implementing the practices on the farm. So thanks over to you, Emmanuel or Jeff. Yeah, and, 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 and Jeff, that's a very good question because in framing gender specific interventions, and it's good you ask that because gender is one of our core, it wasn't a core target when we're doing the pilots, but is a core going forward. Um, it, it's more impactful when, um, and, and Mark can, can also support me here, is we see a lot of those women are also coming from female headed households. So it's not only that, that this production is their primary uh, source of income, it's actually a very important area of livelihood. So in essence, by having these interventions, we are going beyond just AMR and, and good practices to actually supporting livelihoods, actual livelihoods. And what we are trying to do now, and I hope in the next couple of years we are able to present this, is that we want to capture all these relevant data points. You know, how do we actually impact livelihoods? How do we actually impact economies of households and communities? Rather, before we get to the macro, uh, um, macro level of nations and international uh, level. So that's a very good question, Jeff. Again, to re-emphasize, these are very small sample sizes, and some of these effects we are seeing might require to be measured um, across bigger, bigger samples, and we are looking at um, a few thousand samples um, in, in our next pilots. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. And, and if you see them show up on small sample sizes, maybe the effects is large, maybe the effects are large. We'll say, Mark, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I just want to add one additional aspect to this, and that, and this is from our qualitative work, but um, the the females in, in general, in, in most of the areas we work, are also responsible, more responsible for food safety concerns. Um, so when we when we talk to them about AMU or AMR and its relation to food safety, they often feel a more sense of responsibility to you know make products that are that are um, antibiotic you know residue free. Um, of course, um, male farmers also are concerned about this, but it seems like the how integrated females are in the kind of distribution of food, taking care of um, of the home, essentially, um, maybe also makes them a bit more um, a bit more likely to adopt some of these practices as you know they're part of that chain of uh, distribution of food. Yeah, thanks. Back to you, Jeff. Great, thanks. I really appreciate that. Uh, we get a twofer here. Right? <laughs> the both of you joining in is, I know it's a collaborative work uh, and it's nice to have both the biological and social science uh, expertise on the line. A question from the chat, uh, again, regard to the uh, the analysis and, and how did you recruit or select the participants and the controls to uh, participate in that study? Yeah. And, and 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 that's a big question, Jeff. Our attempt to answer this, um, and 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 rightly riding on what you said, our social scientist is in the is in the meeting, and is and is going to give a bit a bit more detail. I think we had, and you know, this is multi layered research. Um, we we had a bit more purposeful something in, in, in this case, because mm -hmm. for the CAP studies, of course, we had target uh, we, had, we had target regions where we wanted to go, but those target regions were already determined by our government counterparts in the countries where we're going. Mm -hmm. And then when we went in those local areas, we ride on the strength of influencers and, 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 and the veterinary delivery systems and the local leadership systems in those in those places. To, to bring to us the willing the willing farmers and then of course from that pool that we that we get we are able to select and, and sample and each country varies the approach varies in each country but also very important I think one of the key cons considerations before Mark comes in that we had here is we had to be careful in selecting the control group because we had we, we had already noted that there was possibility for a spillover effect. When farmers participate in interventions, we saw a very strong um, 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 uptake of the, of, 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 of the learnings 
in the in the local community. So we had to frame the control group away from the areas where we had the intervention, just to ensure that there's no confounder where they are taking up learnings, even if they're not participants. Um, and, 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 and so besides that, I think we're very purposeful, purposeful in, in, in the rest of it. And Mark, please, you, you can come in with a little more detail there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so in, thanks, Emmanuel. So in, in Kenya, like Emmanuel said, it differed between Kenya um, and Ghana. Uh, for these pilot uh, studies. So, for example, in Kenya, we didn't have any records on on layer farmers in the community. So we just did a transect for the CAP study, did a transect, got the names of all of the farmers who are keeping layers in the community and used that to generate a random sample for the CAP. Um, but when it, Ghana had more records, so we were able to use that. But importantly, for the farmer field school, you know, it's it's not, it's something that there's potentially a bias in that because it's our selection of farmer field school participants. We first focused on those individuals who we had CAP uh, information on um, because part of the, the CAP study, we were telling them we're getting this information so we can develop these interventions to help you in your production, to help you on your farm. Um, so part of it is kind of responsibility going back to the people that gave us data in the first place to say, okay, we've come up with this intervention. Are you now interested in participating um, in the intervention? And so we started off uh, with that until we until we hit the we had three farmer field schools in in one location in in one community in Kenya, and we got up to around 60, 65 people in total who wanted to go to the farmer field school out of I think in a uh, a cap study total of 115. And then with the um, with the control, yeah, so we we attempted to identify those farmers who who were geographically um, isolated, if you will, from the areas where we were holding the farmer uh, field schools. you know, but again, you know we 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 recognize that there could be bias because some of the these individuals were in the original cap study. Um, and they just said, I, I don't have time to do the the farmer field school. And so maybe at the beginning, they didn't value improving, you know, biosecurity practices or something like that. So they said no to the farmer field school. So right there, we're almost biasing ourselves in the sense of people are self-selecting into, into this um, intervention that they want to uptake. Um, so, yeah, so that's what, like Emmanuel said. Once we expand, we'll be able to get a bit more sophisticated sampling frame to really try to tease out some of the effects of these of these schools on the farm. Thanks, back to you, Jeff. Great, thank you, Mark, for joining in there. Um, I've got one more question before we close. Uh, and this again related to the farmer field schools and not the participants, but the host or the the farmer champions. Again those people are going to have to want to participate. The two questions are, um, I, I see there's a, a potential risk to invite a whole bunch of other 30 farmers to your your farm. I mean, we, we promote biosecurity and keeping people off your farm, right? So how did you mitigate that risk? And, and did you compensate the, the, I don't know if those those people were actually the facilitators, but the the host farmers to to compensate them for any potential risk that they were they were exposing themselves to. Yeah, and and again, I'm sure Mark would would, would want to come in on, on on this, and that is true. The the risk is actually on two sides. The risk is on our side because you know when we do when we use a um, a host farm. We invest resources, so the experiment has to be run around investing. And again, in different countries, depending. In some countries, actually, I think Ghana, we're using flocks that belong to the farmer. And I think that is why your question is, 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 is relatively very, um, very potent from the, from the host farmer side. But in others, like Kenya, Zambia, Zimbabwe, we actually purchased the, the chicks, the birds, <laughs> and then purchased the, the, the other pro products like feed and, 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 and all. So the risk on our side is that the host farmer agrees and signs to host the school. 
And if they change their mind, maybe because they have a difference with one of the participants in the field, that is completely out of our control. So that's a risk where the farmer decides in the middle of an intervention, I'm no longer interested in doing this. Uh, fortunately, we didn't face that situation. And, and I think it's also kudos to the social science aspect of this intervention is that we are able to maintain the momentum among the participants and the cohesion um, um, among the participants, but directly to the benefit of the host farm and also the risk. Um, and remember, these, these farmer groups are told to work as a community. So the farmers are coming to the host farm to support the host, but the host is also hosting as, as a leadership role in the community. So we're quite deliberate to choose a reliable farmer, um, a leading farmer, and also farmers that were willing themselves, they offered themselves to, to host. What we, are, what, what we have thought about mitigating that in some countries is actually to use facilities like learning, local learning institutions um, or, or, or picking, picking up uh, facilities that are, are out of use or that belong to the community in general rather than to an individual. Um, but but we are not we are not likely to win very very much in this sense. And the direct benefit for the host farmers in in some cases is we upgrade some biosecurity measures. So for instance, we we repair the deep the, the, the deep tank. We make a few changes to the facility, and that benefit remains with them. Um, on the biosecurity front, you are right. In some cases, the, the, the host farmer is both at risk and is also a risk because they insist on continuing their production of other things, and rightly so. It's their house, it's their farm. So we find in some cases where we have um, uh, free-ranging chickens, we have goats and, and other production, including chickens, actually. There were some farms where there were chickens, pigs, and rabbits in production while there was this there was this demonstration going on. And 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 I think we 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 deeply thought about that. How do we factor in biosecurity? How do we prevent transmission and having confounders in certain demonstrations compared to others? And it will be useful to also actually get advice um, um, on some of these uh, pertinent issues. But I think it's an excellent question. Um, the direct benefit also for the for, for the host farm is by default they are forced to take up some of these practices because in a sense they are influenced indirectly to 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 to, to apply some of these good practices and um, them themselves being the, the the host farmers and Mark um, I think you can add a bit more detail to that thanks yeah I, I mean I, you've covered every mostly everything I was going to say I would just like to add we also. Um, strive to provide um, PPE for all the um, participants. So, you know, it's a part of the, obviously the process of learning um, how to integrate proper biosecurity onto your own farm. Um, but we make sure that before the farmers are getting onto the farm. So for example, in Kenya, everybody's uh, washing their hands. Everybody's put, put, everybody's been given gum boots and a coat. Um, and so they're going through the process even before getting on the farm of disinfection. Um, and so, yeah, we try to really emphasize, at, because it's already a big emphasis in the farmer field school, the importance of biosecurity. And that kind of, in a way, allows us, you know, it's learning by doing. So every time you go to the farm, here are the processes that you have to take. Um, and the only thing um, maybe uh, additional to add would be um, that the farmer field school process itself, there's a lot of work that goes in before the farmer field school even um, even begins. And um, a lot of that is having these facilitators who are who go through a three week training, going into the community and identifying uh, potential host farmers, um, and then really explaining what are the responsibilities um, as a host farmer, you know, um, and what are the benefits, what are some of the drawbacks. Um, and so, as Emmanuel said, we've been pretty lucky. So in all of our farmer field schools, we, we haven't had issues with a host farmer um, dropping out yet. So thanks, back to you, Jeff. That's good. Um, I think we could stay on uh, this call, but uh, I think we're going to have to wrap it up here. Uh, so I want to take this time to thank Emmanuel and Mark, too, for joining in in the discussion. We really appreciate that and those who joined. I think I have a uh, slide to share with you.
uh, about the future uh, presentations that we have. Oops, um, right here. So, yeah, that's the, the introductory slide. That's funny that it's. Uh, <laughs> Um, let's see if it'll get back. Sorry about that. Uh, a quick recap of everything that Emmanuel said here. <laughs> uh, until we get right here. All right. Uh, the next uh, knowledge dissemination dialogue will be on November 9th. Note the change in time. Uh, it's at 1230 Central European time. Uh, at that time, we'll be talking about uh, implementing uh, monitoring for AMU and AMR in a small developing country, a presentation by Champagne from Australia. So with that, that's uh, the next uh, webinar. And, and be sure to feel uh, to complete the feedback questionnaire that's available, and if you have any questions, make sure you let us know uh, on this, uh, if you have a, a desire to present some of your own work. So with that, thank you very much, and have a good day. Bye.